that story talks back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides, and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. Born and raised in New York City, Kid Ace has become a top touring illusionist, virtually and in person, and has appeared on hundreds of stages across the U.S., as well as TV shows such as Bill Nye Saves the World, The Steve Harvey Show, and The Kelly Clarkson Show. All right, well, we're really glad to welcome Kid Ace to The Story Talks Back, and here to talk about magic and stories of magic. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for having me, Dave. I'm excited. How are yeah. you? Great, great. You look good. I like your, you. your setup there. Oh, thank you. Same. I love yours. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you a little about sort of going back to your beginnings of your interest in magic. You know, you, this is your whole career now. You, you've developed a really great following. Um, how did, what were some of the stories about magic and magicians that really kind of galvanized your interests? I think in the beginning when I first started magic, it was sort of like this world that like, for me, I just had to discover it. I started out in theater first and then my theater teacher showed me a magic trick which really got me hooked on how do i figure out i have to figure out how this is done and to make a long story short i ended up taking a trip down to the magic shop after you know bugging him for two weeks straight uh rob mcintosh he finally gave me the directions and the phone number to tannin's magic shop in new york city after that, you know, I just discovered magic and there's been this thing, this bug that has bitten me and I've been stuck with it ever since. Uh, throughout, throughout the years of doing magic, I discovered stories that inspired me or just watching people that inspired me. Like, you know, of course, David Copperfield, David Blaine, but uh, there are some really amazing, interesting uh, stories of African-American magicians that I didn't even know existed until I came across uh, someone else who, shared that story and then doing my own research yeah i mean do you do you remember what that trick was the first one yeah the first trick the first trick that i i really fell in love with was he took a red handkerchief and he stuffed it into his fist he stuffed it into his fist and then when he opened his hand the handkerchief was gone now this is a classic in magic it's classic and when you find out the secret it's, it's actually really simple, right? Uh -huh. But your mind is all over the place. You, I mean, it is, it is just amazing. Like the technique to do it is so simple, but it blew me away. And I was like, I had to figure out how he did this. I mean, this is a bright red object. He, I, I visually see him stuff it into his fist. And when he opened his hand, it was gone. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he did that to me every day for two weeks and he finally came in and then uh, gave me the the information for the magic shop and it's, it's been history since so. and all the tricks are are based on this you know this secrecy you know this uh you know i mean you know that it's something that conforms to physical reality but you know it and we don't so it's uh it's like a mystery story or do you think that's part of the appeal for you I think part I think part of the appeal for me is at first like the sense of like how how is this happening like for me like and to, I'm really I'm a science person like I like to break things down and I like to figure out the inner workings of a lot of things I've always been like that I've been intrigued by that so that's kind of what grabs me into magic is like how is that done I got to figure that out and I think 
part of the allure for like the general public is is that also that mystery it's like okay that was amazing and now i can never figure out because this is like this secret society like how do these magicians figure this, these things out how do they accomplish these effects uh, and create these illusions and of course that all that all has gotten diluted because of the internet like so it keeps it just like every other industry it keeps magic and, and, and magicians on their toes to constantly create new methods and be ahead of the curve because you know once one thing is um, put out into the public then you can just go google something or youtube something and maybe it's being revealed in some way shape or form but then there's always the next day where some new method comes out and it uh, actually helps it actually helps magic stay relevant and stay on the cutting edge you know? I guess the internet has changed a lot and probably raised the bar in terms of what people find surprising. Absolutely. Exciting. Yeah, and it also, it also allows us, I mean, it, it does because there's so much information coming at us all day long to cut through that noise. Uh, you, it has to be something really powerful or meaningful at that moment and at the right time, right? So yeah, the internet has done that for a lot of industries, but it also has done that a lot for magic too. It's allowed, you know, it, it's allowed people to, I remember back in the day when you would watch uh, shows on TV and you would watch the magic of David Copperfield or David Blaine's latest special. And you wonder, oh man, how in the world did they get that TV agent? Like how did they, ascend to that level of success and you you're like how do i get in touch with these gatekeepers but now with just the internet you don't need any of that you can literally build your entire audience and and build build your fan base in your in your bedroom right right you know there's no it's like the wild, wild west. I don't think it'll be like that for long, but it is similar to that now. I mean, it seems like, you know, in every every sort of creative field, you know, there's more opportunity for a certain amount of success. But, you know, to be like a David Copperfield, you need more than just, you know, yourself pushing it, right? Yes, you need, you need, you definitely need a strong team of like-minded individuals, but uh, also laser focused, you know, you have to be laser focused. I think someone like David Copperfield is just otherworldly in terms of his thought process and how he navigates life, right? So he has one goal and that is to, to be that character david copperfield and, and and you believe it right because he's so he's so in it it's 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 who he is it's his it defines his existence so when, if he walks into a room you feel like wow like i'm i'm in the presence of some mystical figure like this is you know but this is in, in all reality this is someone who just created this character and has validated it throughout the years and you know it's That's interesting because you bring up the whole idea of the mystique you know and the mystique, yeah. a character it's not enough to just be a person who does tricks right yep. i mean like you go back to houdini you know that poster you've got behind you you know um he was, he was actually yeah this was actually him performing in patterson new jersey no way yeah, at the Lyceum Theater. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So he created, you know, this, not just a guy who could escape from things, he created a whole mystique, and that seems to continue to this day. I mean, and that's like storytelling. I mean, that's like a character in a novel, you know? I mean, how do you go about, you know, you get to do the tricks, right? You learn how to do the tricks, but then how do you go about sort of forming that character, you know, Kid Ace, like how did Kid Ace come to be? So when I was thinking about developing Kid Ace, it was more so uh, tapping into multiple things. And 
there was a lot of there was a lot of trial and error on like what feels right to me on like who and what name I wanted to choose. But you know, I drew from a lot of my inspirations, and one of my biggest inspirations was Kid Cudi. He's he's a music artist, and I, I adopted that first name, and I and then I was thinking, okay, well, how can I make this my own, right? Because a lot of people can do that. So I looked at who I was. I grew up in Harlem, spent most of my life there, and I grew up on the A and C train lines. And as the A and C train lines moved downtown, they met up with the E train lines. And I used to perform on the C train. I used to do magic tricks for money on the subway. Wow. And I took, I took ACE, Kid Ace. And I just thought that was appropriate because at that time, I could never have imagined, um, you know, where it would go, but I was just doing it for the love of it. And it, it was me, you know, so I, I, I took that and that's how I got Kid Ace. That's a great story. But I mean, that's the name. Like, how did you develop the persona? I mean, is there a persona, Kid Ace, that's different from who you yeah, are? I think, I, think, I, I think it's, I don't think it's truly different than who I am. I think it's, I think it's a mashup of where I want to go and who I am, right? So it's constantly evolving every time I'm moving up on the path that I'm choosing to do, whether it's, you know, uh, landing the type of shows that I want or whatever environment or, or TV, a TV gig that I'd like to get. I'm constantly like adding software to that computer of Kid Ace. So it's, it's constantly evolving. I, I think it is me, uh, the bones of it, but then I'm pulling inspiration every day that I feel as though, oh, okay. I could, I could, I could add that to the persona, or I could add that to the way I dress, or I could add that to the way mm. I speak on stage, or you know, or the music choices that I make when I'm performing, if I'm performing live. So I think that's really the it's a mashup of just me continuing to move forward. Like, do you feel like when you're performing that you are a different person, that you are playing a character? when I'm performing, I, I feel, I feel the most like myself, actually, like I feel the most free. You know, I feel, I feel like it's really, when I'm in society, like if I'm like going to a supermarket, like I have to like act a certain way, right? Like, and it's funny because my wife will like tell me like, you're talking to yourself or you're picking up these objects. And I'm like, fiddling with the object and I've got to remember like people probably think I'm crazy you know like I'm in I'm in the soda aisle and I'm I'm messing with objects and I'm doing things and then people are like you know what's going on uh but when I when I'm on stage I can do whatever and it's like the ultimate pass it's the ultimate pass to be you know who I am interesting yeah I mean when you think about the stories of other magi magicians, you know, mm -hmm. um, did any of them, again, really inspire you in terms of how they presented themselves or how they, how they formed their own character? Yeah, definitely. I think one of my first, there's two that are really, I mean, of course, you've got, as I mentioned before, you got David Copperfield, who has made this, you know, he has made this a thing like was when you go back to Houdini he was he transcended magic right he became like right. the world's first celebrity like he was like right. the first celebrity I mean it was Charlie Chaplin Houdini these were like the first guys to really be out there right and uh and of course there were magicians along the way like Thurston was a big magician after Houdini all these guys you can look up Carter uh, so there are some guys who got traction, but then you get to the point where there's a David Copperfield and that's the next Houdini, right? Like that's the next guy. So it's like once a generation or once every few generations, you get that. And for me, it was David Blaine. When David Blaine came on the scene, I was like, oh my God, like this guy is from where I'm from and he's mysterious, but he doesn't have a top hat. He doesn't have a cane. He doesn't have glitter on his shirt. I mean, there are, when you, when you thought of magic, you thought Siegfried and Roy. I mean, you thought, 
the glitz and the glamour of Vegas, the showgirls, the tigers. And then there was this guy who showed up with a deck of cards and he was, he was dressed in a t-shirt and he was just talking to the guest and he was talking and it wasn't about him. It was about the, it was about the people's reactions, right? Like he turned the camera on the people and that's what sold the show. That's what sold the brand of David Blaine. And it, be, it just, it, it, it like took me to a whole nother place of where I thought magic could be. You know, I, I always thought magic was one way. And then when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, there's so many possibilities to innovate and, and, and be different and do things like that. And so, and then Chris Angel came along too, right? So he's also changed the game as well with his style. And he really, um, he really has that influence from like rock and, and um, MTV. Rock superstars. MTV, yeah. They keep pulled that and put that onto his character as well. So I think That's those two were big, big influences. And, and it's uh, interesting though, because Houdini, you know, was sort of at the beginning of motion pictures, mm -hmm. right? And yep. that's how he became, you know, these reels of him doing his tricks that they showed in movie palaces, right? Yep. And all yeah, of these guys have kind of developed as the media have developed. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a turning point, right? Like, I feel like all these people who have these moments, it is, it is being prepared when opportunity strikes, preparation and opportunity. And I think all of those guys were prepared when the opportunity was right. You know, it's, and it, it can never be recreated. It can never, it, it was their moment. It was the moment for that to happen. They just so happened to be ahead of the curve and, and they, they made it work and they, and it, and look now, I mean, you, you, you cannot recreate what, uh, what David Copperfield did in the eighties and nineties. Uh, because it was this new thing. It was like, wow, like this, this is the new form of this art. And then when you got to the late nineties, you had David Blaine doing, it, it went from like, okay, let me go make this mountain disappear. Right. To like a simple car trick and turning the car trick, turning that, uh, turning the camera off from the magician, like, look at my hair. It's not look at me anymore. It's, it's, oh my God, I did this effect. Now let's look at the public, everyday people that we could all relate to walking around the streets of New York. Who is this mysterious stranger, David Blaine? Who is this guy? You know, and he took, he took a hold of that moment. And I think, it, it, I know for a fact that can never be recreated because he changed magic trajectory. So it went from the big stage magic to close up in your face, on the streets and he was the leader of that so he he cemented in history for that it's like a reality tv almost like that same momentum it's, like, it's the same thing it's the same thing and i think the battle of the two when chris angel came about uh it was it was this thing where blaine was doing the close-up magic on the streets but chris was taking stage illusions which were only seen on stage on these biggest glitz and glamour uh, stages. And he was taking them and, and, and adapting them to the streets and adapting them to everyday life where you didn't even know they were illusions because they were just in a park with a blanket instead of on a stage with a shiny box and a curtain, you know? So he, he was definitely uh, someone who also, you know, moved magic forward as well. Thinking back, you know, sort of on your own personal history, I mean, were there people in your past who sort of influenced this uh, interest in the dramatic and this interest in, you know, stories of surprise and mystery? Um, people in your family who really, you know, influenced you as storytellers and performers? Um, at the moment, looking back, because that's a, that's a great question. I never really thought of it. I think at the moment, looking back, um, I think it was something I just found uh, through my interest of, of reading and 
documentary. I, I, it was never a person in my family who really made me feel as though, okay, this is a, this is a great storyteller. I need to pick this up. And of course, I've had amazing stories being told to me from my parents and grandparents and great aunts. And those are like real treasures, but I, I wouldn't say that was the sole reason why. I think it was something I never thought about. I think it just more so happened, you know, something that just happened. Uh -huh. And what about, you know, being an African-American magician? You know, it, it, it seems like, you know, all the people we've been talking about for the most part are white guys. So, yeah. you know, did you feel like you were stepping into something? Was there anybody who sort of came before you whose story you could at least be inspired by? Absolutely. And I didn't learn about this until I was much older in magic. I started magic when I was 12. Uh -huh. But when I got older, I started to hear stories about Richard Potter and Henry Box Brown, who were prolific magicians of their time. But you're talking about times when African Americans were enslaved, right? So in this country. And particularly Henry Box Brown has inspired me because it his life and his story is a total metaphor and it still applies to us today if we really want to accept it. Mm. Uh, Henry Box Brown is just incredible. He was, he was a magician who would perform magic, but he packed himself into a packing crate and he shipped himself from the South to freedom up North. So yeah. that's how he escaped slavery. That's exactly how he escaped slavery. He shipped himself up. And uh, he became he became a pretty well-known performer. And I actually have a friend, Rory Rennick, who actually, he was another African-American magician who recreates Henry, Bro Henry Box Brown's life and uh, also teaches it as an ed session and theater show as well across the country. Uh, wow. So I love that Rory pr preserves the history of Henry Box Brown, but he's definitely, you know, today you look at what this country is going through and mentally it'll, we can tell ourselves we can escape this. This isn't something that has to be. We can create our own reality. If someone like that, who was way more oppressed than uh, I am at this moment, or, you know, any other person who may deal with oppression, it, it's like, okay, this is tough, but there are people before us who have overcome even higher obstacles. So I, I think we'll get past this. I think we just have to figure out what is our box, right? Like, what is our escape route? Like, how are we going to create it? And I think for, particularly for me, it is, the, it's the arts, it's the magic. It's keeping my mind focused on that and using that as a tool to navigate uh, and get out of this chaotic world that we're in. I mean, are there certain elements of your act or your persona that you know were specifically influenced by being an African-American or uh, history or your experiences? Absolutely. Uh, definitely when I'm speaking on stage, there are certain acts where I tell stories. Um, definitely motivational pieces in my show, my live show. And then also just the fun, right? Like our culture is just so fun. We like to dance. We like music. Uh -huh. uh, definitely the music in my show is upbeat. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a moment, right? Like when you, when you come, you leave with this sense, well, my goal is for you to leave with this sense of, wow, that was a time that I will always remember and always can call back to. I remember as a kid going to things like Coney Island and, and hanging out at the amusement park, being eight years old, but I can still recall the exact memory. I can still recall, you know, that smell of like a carnival or, you know, going to a haunted house or getting on the wonder wheel, right? So I would love people who come to experience some of my magic and take the influence that I'm putting out 
to feel that, right? So I, I, I definitely use hip hop culture, magic, and infuse the two. And that's sort of sort of the basis of where I go. And then we flow from there and during the show. <laughs> do you feel house. like do you feel like you've had more obstacles to overcome because you're African American? Um absolutely I may not even have noticed them. And, and in fact a lot of the times I don't notice them until a day or two later when I'm reflecting and I'm like, oh, okay, I understand, you know, uh, but also in the same sense, it, it also, oddly, it also helps in a lot of ways in terms of the mystique, right? Uh, the minute, the minute you meet someone and they ask you, what do you do? say magician, and then they go, oh, what instrument do you play? It doesn't process in their mind, right? Like, I'm like, no, 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 like, I'm an illusionist. Like, I create illusions. And then it's like, oh, my God, I never met a Black magician before. Like, you know, and then it's another level of intrigue that you can play off of when mm. you're, you know, if you're in the middle of a performance or, or just interacting with someone on a daily basis, pretty, it, it goes both ways, right? It's not all gloom and doom, but there's also some benefits to, to it, right? Because it allows people to see, which has been the case for ever, that, uh, you know, African-Americans can do things that are outside of basketball, that are outside of, you know, music, uh, and we exist. Right, like it, it, it's there. I'm not an anomaly. Like sure. it's, it's around. I, I have a lot of black magician friends. You know, uh, we are there. It's just, it just hasn't been on the level. Hasn't been put in the mainstream enough for people to really understand that this is, this is a thing, and it's okay, and it's not this odd thing. Like you know, it's, we're here right? We can do multiple things. Uh, we can do a lot of things in the arts and then there's no limit. There's just, it's just, it shouldn't be a thing. When you meet, you know, when you meet a white guy, a white, a, a white guy and he goes, oh, I'm a magician. You're like, oh, cool. When did you start doing magic? It's like when you meet a black person and they say, oh, I'm a magician. How did you discover that? Like, it, you know, like <laughs> it's like this next, you got, and then you have to explain again, like, oh yeah, like, Oh, okay, yeah, there's a, there's a route to this and, you know, uh, I think it's a touchy subject, but it's, it goes both ways. It can be, there has been times where I felt it being a hindrance or being a roadblock. And there are times where I felt it being, you know, to my advantage. Sure. And it's just over the years, I'm just learning how to, to play the two. <laughs> you know, to really <laughs> enjoy the game of both ends of it because it can definitely get tough when you're sitting at home or you're driving and you realize you just encountered something because of your race, right? So it's uh it can be tough sometimes, but there are some good in it. There's some good in it. So like if you were to sort of picture where you want to be say five years from now you know what what story would you say you want to play out i mean obviously everybody's adapting to right. this crazy situation but do you have like a vision story or an idea of what you want to be doing yeah absolutely i think first and foremost i think my mental health is definitely the strongest thing for me because uh, if we could just talk about this for a minute, uh, the uh, in this country when we were dealing with Black Lives Matter, the movement and uh, the climate politically and socially, it took such a toll on me that I never thought was possible. I I I, I thought. I was like, man, you know, I really feel bad for people who suffer from mental health issues or depression, you know? <laughs> and I thought, 
that's just not me. It's not in me. You know, I, I feel bad for the people that deal with it. And then when it hit me on this level, I, I, I took weeks to recover from it. And I said to myself, whoa, like, I have to really take this seriously and really control the information that I'm consuming and what I'm putting my time into and my energy and my thoughts into and understanding because it went from, okay, I'm getting hit by all of this, all of this uh, turmoil and I, I don't want to process it. But then in order to process it, I have to understand my history and to understand my history, I then have to go back hundreds of years and, 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 and re-educate myself because all these things are taught to us as kids when we're African-Americans from our parents, right? Like the history, uh, the people who've come before us, the writers, the, the speakers, the everything, the abolitionists, everything that's come before us to help us get to this point. But we sort of live in this bubble of the new world are so what we thought was the new world, right? Because behind that bubble, it still exists. That racism, that hate, right it all it still it still exists um in everyday life whether we see it or we don't but the way i was going about life i was so i i tuned it out to the point where i be, became oblivious at times to what was happening to me directly or around me to other people and failing to really pick up on it and there if it wasn't so blatant instead of it being a dog whistle right like if it wasn't so you know, black and white, then I totally was like, oh, that can't be the case. Nobody really, you know, and then it got to a point where it would, I started to reflect and go, okay, you know, this is this. And now after going through, you know, people of, of, of my past, like W.E.B. Du Bois and reading, you know, the souls of black folk and understanding the dual reality, uh, the double consciousness that uh, he spoke about, which is, and this is really how I was navigating my life. When, when, when black people, we have to learn two languages. We have to learn the language of black people and we have to learn the language of white people. When we are home with our family and friends and we are one way, we are having a great time. But when we enter our work environment, our career, uh, we are navigating the world as a white person through their language, right? The way we act, the way we speak, the way we, and it's a double, it's a double consciousness, it's a dual reality that we don't even know we're training ourselves to have, you know, until you start to reflect. And then you look back, which I did, you start realizing who am I? You you just it, it hits you on so many levels. Uh it hits you on so many levels. And then then you get fired up, right? And then you start, then you start reading about James Baldwin and then you start reading about how you can uh you know eloquently write how you feel and then you start to push that energy out there and i think to this point now after diving deep and all of that i realized the number one thing for me aside from the magic my life what i've devoted my life to be has to be my mental health because none of it exists without it no, nothing nothing i have nothing i want it, it doesn't do anything for me unless I can wake up and be motivated to create or, or write or speak to someone. If I'm not motivated to do any of that, then there's no point. There's no point in being here, you know? That's so I think my mental health is, again, the key to all of this. And I, I think that's really what I want, not just for five years from now, but mm -hmm. the duration of my time here forever, how long, you know, how, how long that will be, but. It's a great perspective. It took me a long time to realize that, right? Because I'm, I'm like really ambitious. I think I'm going to be ambitious for a long time. I don't ever want to stop being ambitious, but I think there, there are key moments in life that make you stop and really reevaluate. That was being one of them. Uh, my parents passing was another one. Uh, anyone who's lost a parent knows that it is, it is, it is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual feeling. You really, you really reevaluate and time doesn't exist anymore. You start to look at the world differently. You, uh, 
you question your past, things you could have done, things you didn't do, questions you didn't ask. And then you start to appreciate time and you're like, oh man, like I have to look around and I have to really appreciate and not just be, you know, point A, point B, you know, I have to really soak up the energy of people and, and the things around me and appreciate them, right? So that's what I want to appreciate. That's really cool. I love that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you well, so you much know. for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for uh, opening that door. It's it's cool to talk about, right? It's cool yeah, to definitely. It's cool um, to definitely. Like, anything else you you want to talk about while we're while we're on? Uh, sure. How about how about I show you uh, a magic trick? That would be so cool. With that, that let's let's do something. This is okay for those of, for those of you listening. This is also being recorded uh, live on Zoom, uh, <laughs> so you guys will be. No yeah, you, you will be able to see this as well. Uh, this is cool. Uh, let's do something pretty cool. I love close-up magic, and um, I think it's really powerful. I think it's probably one of the most popular forms of magic because the magic is happening right in front of you, right? There's no smoke, no mirrors. It's just literally just you and the magician and pure magic. Uh, if I could choose to have any superpower, I would really choose to aim to have the ability to manipulate time because then I could do uh, things like, you know, going back and playing the lottery, right? That would be something I would do. Uh, but right now I do something organic, something that we could really wrap our minds around. I would, I would take this crust, this crust on both sides. It's a can of Coca-Cola. It's crushed. It's open and empty. And I would reverse time and bring it back to a state before it was drink. Now, some of your viewers are going to see the can as it reshapes shapes itself. You may even hear the can as it begins to bend and refill itself. But I guarantee you, you won't forget the moment either way. Check this out as I reverse time. Check that out. The can is no longer crushed. It's no longer crushed. And that's pretty that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. But the can, the can, the can is still open. It's still open. Let's reseal the can. Let's reseal the can. Resealed. <laughs> now there are some people watching who may be skeptics. So you can actually hear the can reopen if you listen. I'll reopen it. Listen. <laughs> and then there's always the final touch where you take that newly opened can and you actually pour some soda out of it. There you go, crushed. It's not even flat. It's not flat. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. I thought I'd share that with you. That was great. It's just as good to, on Zoom as it is in person. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely, that's the thing, right? Magic can, um, magic has this ability. I think the closest thing to each other is music. It's a universal language. You don't need to speak the same language to appreciate magic. I could go to China. I can go to a jungle uh, in South America. I can go to Africa. I can go anywhere in the world and sure, yeah. share this art form and I will be able to communicate with someone. It's like music. Music has that power, right? Music has that power to just move you, whether it's an instrumental or as lyrics. Um, yeah, it's just one of those special things. Really appreciate you sharing that with us. Oh, Dave, you're welcome. I thank you for having me. This was great. I mean, we've known each other for a few years now, and I thought this was just an awesome opportunity, and I was really appreciative to be a part of it. And I think it's it's really cool. I think this uh, this is a really cool project, and I'm looking forward to hearing others speak uh, and be a part of the journey. The journey. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Kid Ace. And uh... thank you. We'll connect again soon and uh, 
really loved your stories and your your sharing with us. Thank you so much. All right, Dave. Take care. The Story Talks Back is produced and hosted by Dave Stanton. The music you're hearing now was written and performed by Christopher Daydream. The theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven, performed by Kronos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.